Hi everyone, it's Kevin Raber from Photo PXL on our conversations with continues today with uh, UK photographer, Paul Reefer. And um, I bumped into Paul online and uh, he's a very big phase one user and capture one user. And uh, it doesn't matter what you use, but his images are what really caught me. So um, I asked him if he'd be kind enough to uh, sit down and have a brief chat with us today. And he was, and I think you'll enjoy talking to Paul. He's got a great outlook. He's doing some amazing photography in you know, many feature sets, uh, just not landscapes and so forth. And uh, I'm sure we'll share some of those images throughout the, the presentation. Um, and you know, we, we're all facing the same thing. So um, Paul and I were just joking a little bit about the, the news cycles and you know, how much, even though I'm an American and he's a, a Brit, you know, we're watching each other's news pretty quickly. It's a crazy time for all of us. But you know, while we're doing these things, we're in lockdown and, and working through the, the pandemic, uh, we're all still concentrating on our photography. And I know for me, for example, we were about to launch all our workshops uh, for 2021 with my fingers crossed and uh, figuring I might as well throw the puck out there on the ice and skate towards it rather than wait for it to come back to me and react afterwards. I can always cancel things, but um, at least we'll all get a head start. So good morning, Paul, or actually it's uh, early afternoon for mid-afternoon for you. And uh, thanks for stopping by here with me. And uh, let's start this off with, you know, telling us a little bit about yourself, where you're actually located, what you're doing, you have a big studio, la la la, you know? Yeah, so I mean, it's funny you talk about the um, the current news of the day. Um, so I'm now, what, what, what are we in month, in the UK terms, we're in month four or five of what was lockdown, but certainly travel down. Um, so I've come from 291 nights in different countries last year to spending a solid four and a half months at home. Um, so this is, we worked out, this is the longest time I've ever spent at home since the age of about 14 and it hurts, um, which I'm sure you're, you're I'm feeling, feeling the as well. Same way, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, I think, uh, yeah, by way of intro. So, um, I well currently um, I specialize in the landscape or cityscape um, photography for um, brands that that frankly um, quite often want to print big, um, hence partly the the link into phase one in that sense. Um, but I've always done um, the the sort of landscape thing since I can remember since I was even a kid. Um, I actually learned, funnily enough, the first sort of proper photography that I was doing, as in professional paid photography, was actually um, shooting models a long time ago in the studio in London, um, doing model books uh, for agencies and stuff like that. Um, and then just basically drifted off and decided that I didn't want to do people anymore. Um, I want to do the uh, the travel and destination stuff, which was a lot more exciting for me. Um, but in, in terms of, if you go back to raw background, my background was actually corporate. Um, you know, I, I left school, um, with lots of, well, I had good university offers and all that sort of stuff. Um, left it and went and worked for a retailer um, in their head office and did project management for a while. Went to another, um, went to a dot com actually. Um, moved out and did the dot com thing until that went wrong in 2001. Um, I will forever be responsible for everyone's pensions being worthless. I'm aware of that, yes. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, everyone was, unfortunately. Um, and then came back to the UK and did a corporate thing for a while got traveling with corporate um and what i found was and actually the the tipping point for me was i was once sat in a board meeting um thinking of what i was going to go and photograph at the weekend and i, I it sort of dawned on me i'm never photographing something and thinking about what i'm going to do in the board meeting so i have this the wrong way around yeah. um so and, and frankly it was a bit of a risk you know, I, I get every now and then some of our workshop clients will say to me you know well, you know what's the secret when when does it click so you know when when do all of a sudden i make money out of this stuff and the answer is you know i i worked pretty much for no real profit for four or five years something like that if you look at it in those sense um and it was a long slog and and but to the point where we moved a, a long way back uh, back in what was it 2000 10 11 something like that to be focusing purely then on right this is this is a profession this is my business um and dumped everything by the wayside and, and honestly i wouldn't ever for a second think of going back because it's too much fun yeah well, there, there's no question it's a lot of fun and um 
it, it is scary times to, to go into business yourself. It, it is. I'm, I'm seeing, you know, I'm, I'm seeing friends of mine that I've known in the business for a long time, um, either pulling out or being forced to pull out because, you know, stuff, stuff is getting really tough it is. Um, on every front. You know, workshops, no one can travel or no, could travel. Um, corporates, well, half the corporates were shutting down and laying off their staff. The other half were sort of being very careful with the budget and, and all that sort of stuff. Um, you know, prints in the industry right now, you know, we're still selling prints. Don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm actually very happy that we have a, a, a print business, but um, certainly it's taking a dip just because discretionary spend is getting hit. And, and if I look at, you know, those three elements of the photography industry, which are all the, you know, from the landscape point of view, they're the three solid ones. Each one in its own way has taken a real dent um, and it's going to take some time to, to come back. You know, I got an email the end of last week about uh, from one of them and said, look, you know, I'm giving up photography. I liked it. I loved it. It was I was free. I could do what I want. Luckily, I had my wife helping out make money. But I'm now working at Home Depot. And you know what? I like it. I get to work with people. Yeah. I get a paycheck. There's no pressure. I, I have a team of people <laughs> I can go and have a beer with. And uh, yeah. I, I think I'm going to hang out here for a while. And, yeah. uh, you know, photography was glamorous. I mean, you're, you've are you seen it as well as I have if, since you've been in it as long as I have. If, if it, you know, there, there's these guys, they buy these expensive cameras and they become photographers and they think they can become a landscape photographer. They realize they're not selling prints and don't really understand things. So maybe I'll, sh I'll do a couple of workshops. You know, then they price the workshops really low a lot of times just so they can go there and then they don't offer the quality on the workshops and, you know, people are disappointed and, you know, that's a whole story. I mean, it's... I, I'm surrounded with it. Uh, where I live, so in, in the, well, I live on the south coast of the UK and it is synonymous with um, sort of minibus workshops, if we call them that. Um, but actually, if you look at what those guys are doing, I'm sorry, it's not fair, what a lot of those guys are doing, you're basically paying for them to shoot. Yep. And that's not what a workshop is. The, the workshop is I'm paying for your knowledge and your time, um, not for us all to stand on the hill and for you to go and shoot what you want to do instead. So, yeah, we, we see it here. I think, you know, for me, you know, I've been to so many locations so many times, like Antarctica 20 some odd times. My biggest joy now is watching uh, the photographers when they come, the attendees to the workshop, uh, be blown away by the experience of what they're seeing. And then work really hard through the years that I've been there to help them see differently while they're there. So they come back, yeah. you know, not only with the postcard pictures, which is kind of easy to do f very quickly because there's so much, but actually, you know, slow down and dive into the, the environment a little bit and, and really try to come back with some of the, the better photographs. I, I, I've, I've written about it quite a lot um, over the last sort of year or two about um, the way that our, our outlook on these places has changed. And, and actually, it, it, what's funny for me is it's tying it into what's going on at the moment. So you know, everyone knows the, the sort of the selfie generation, the narcissism united, the, you know, all of that stuff that's going on with, with locations and the honeypots places. So everyone wants to go and get their shot at Yoko Salon. Everyone wants to go and get their shot at, you know, Mesa Arch and whatever else. Um, those places are becoming saturated, were becoming saturated. They were becoming, you know, we, we are, we were trashing our locations. We're trashing our planet. Oh, yes. Um, now, one good thing that's happened with the lockdown stuff that was happening around the world at the beginning, and this is, this is what worries me a little bit, but at the beginning, all of a sudden there was this instant respect for travel. Because when you can't do something, all of a sudden you, you just value it more. It becomes sure. more, um, I don't know, more precious to you. Um, but what I'm seeing now is over the, certainly the last month or so, as, as things have started to ease up a little bit, I'm already seeing signs of people forgetting that. And, and, and what's sad to me is I remember when we learned that all of a sudden travel was being locked down. Part of me was sat thinking, okay, so that's going to have an impact on our business as well as other people's business for sure. But part of me was actually thinking, well, that, that's what I do. I, I, that's, that's part of me. I've always traveled. I've always been in different places. I've always tried to experience places. So not standing in line to take the picture of the famous cliff in Norway and all that sort of stuff, but actually going into the towns and experiencing different places and different cultures and stuff like that. And that just got taken away instantly. And what worries me is I think people now 
have almost forgotten the fact that it was that easy to be taken away because they're so desperate there's pent up desire now to get back out there again and and off we go what worries me is where so where do we go from here then because if we haven't learned from that it doesn't get better and back in january february before all this it, it was, it's not a great place to to be at the moment in those in those honey pots as it were um i just hope that something lasts out of this well, I, let, let's let's hope. I mean, I'm one of the things that we're going to be doing to our site is we're adding on um, a number of uh, third-party uh, type programs. Like, you know, for uh, every thousand uh, dollars we take in on a workshop, we'll plant a tree or something. Um, there's a couple of really good organizations out there that we want to be part of. But you know, as we also look at you know the the, the way people behave and the, the environment and what's all out there, it's going to be a you know, it's going to be a change. We're seeing here in America right now such pent up energy to get out that uh, I was talking to a friend up near Glacier Park, uh, Glacier National Park, and he says the lines to get in the park, the people doing recreational vehicle and tent, tent, tent camping and tent trailer camping, uh, everybody, the, the, everybody's out. And he says it's just, it, it's scary. You know, you the crowds are huge. Nobody's going to Europe, obviously. So all the European people that wanted a vacation in Europe, you know, they got to go somewhere in America. Those that want to get out, and, you know, take a risk. Yeah. And they're all trying to, you know, drive to places and, and do things that way. And, you know, our parks are being overrun. So, you know, even if we were free, you know, I'd, I'd be sitting the summer out or, you know, going to places that, uh, you know, I'll just discover off the side. And oh, actually, yeah, I'll, I'll be back. Ne I'll be back next year. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and I think this is the the interesting thing too. I mean, everybody's heading to the iconic landscapes that social media has made so famous. Um, yep. Yet, uh, and I'm sure you know. I'm looking through your portfolio. We both share a number of the the same images. You know, Mesa Arch yeah. and others like oh, that. We, we've we've done them. There's, 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 frankly, there's a checkbox list of of the standard shots. I'm finding there's things that aren't in parks, that are, you know, in the back roads of America and other places, you know, that are yielding terrific shots. And you don't have to put up with somebody next to you or even somebody trying to figure out where he, that you, you took those pictures. Maybe they will once they see them on social media and stuff. But, um, you know, I'm all for trying to find places that are just as pretty that aren't protected like that, you know? Yeah, to, to be honest, um, from my point of view, there's sort of two fronts on that. One is, um, it, <laughs> From, if I look at the workshop aspect of it, one of the reasons that we have the workshop clients that we do is because in the places that we'll take them to that we know very well, yes, we can go and take the standard shots that you want to go, the postcard shots, and, and everyone wants that one shot of X place and whatever, but we'll take people to places that A, aren't overstressed by tourism, B, are unique in that less people, frankly, less people have that image. And C, it's a bit more of a surprise because you're getting somewhere and you're having to think about it. You're having to work at it. And, and if you go to these recipe places where everyone has the picture already in their head, they know what they're going to do to take that picture. It's not a challenge because it, it's already been done a thousand times. Whereas if you go somewhere that is genuinely new and fresh, you've got to start thinking again and, and you come alive again because you're starting to actually adapt to what's in front of you. Um, so on the on the workshop front, there's sort of that element. On the on the frankly print front, um, if I'm trying to sell a print of the the same shot or the same place that there are another twenty thousand people out there that have similar prints for, yes, there'll be different price points and there'll be different customers at those different points, and some people will prefer your image to someone else's. But you know, you're you're lobbing a print into a pool of you know twenty thousand others and hoping that someone likes yours the most you don't have anything unique there's nothing there that's that's special um and you can get lucky you know i, I have one particular shot that we shot um it's the sydney opera house um so for those people that have, have been to sydney a, a lot before you know circular quay is a very 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 busy ferry port and, and cruise terminal and all the other stuff so there's there's never a second when something's not moving around in during daylight hours um, except for, it turns out, um, at about four o'clock in the morning, the day after Christmas, um, if you get up from your hotel with a really bad hangover um, because you can't sleep and you think, oh, screw it, I'm going to go down to the dock and, and go take pictures, we got a completely still 
completely flat circular key with a you know reflection across the water and nothing uh, getting in the way and then a really cool sunrise and whatever so to me that shot then becomes unique of a standard place but you've got to be really really lucky to get away with that the rest of the time you've got to go and find unique it, yep. it's got to be somewhere that you now as you say you know you may not give the location away and actually i'd encourage people not to in that sense because part of the fun in it is finding places not just following your phone to a position and then putting your tripod down well what you know i'm finding these days is and, and i've written about it <clears throat> it's called picture in a picture meaning you know we can go up to one of those giant waterfalls in, in iceland and you know you photograph the whole waterfall and you make the same old picture but throw a 100 to 400 or uh, lens on the camera and, and zoom into the bits and the pieces like halfway up the waterfall where you just got the water going down against the basphalt rock or at the very bottom where you do a time exposure the water just bouncing off the rock and hitting and they become individual pictures that nobody's seeing because they're like seeing the big shot and you know they turn out to be remarkable photographs that are sellable yeah oh we, we have a, there's a shot that um i took oh must be, I don't know, three or four years ago. So you, you said, you'll, you'll know this. Um, in Yosemite National Park, there's this one old broken tree in the middle of the meadow. Uh, it's a really, it's a really, it's a, it's a famous tree in that sense. Um, but everyone goes there, and I've seen, I've seen a million photos. Everyone's there with their, their big wide lens because you want to get the shot of Half Dome in the background and all the mountains and stuff like that. Um, and anyway, I, I, again, it was almost luck rather than judgment. We were driving through, and I had, a, as you say, I had a zoom lens on my camera. And frankly, I couldn't be bothered to, to switch lenses. So I got out of the car and there was this mist coming across and, and all cool. Filled the frame with this tree. And so there's nothing. So and, and actually one person said to me, but I don't know it's in Yosemite. I'm like, yeah, great. Because the shot itself is not about where you are. It's about that looks cool. Um, and in that's the stuff that my shots that I've got where I've sort of felt or sort of felt I've got something different here have always been where someone has said almost it almost derogatory terms but but that's not clear now that's why why didn't you take the big picture that I've seen a million times it's like, well because you've seen it a million times um I want to do the different thing and actually it's fun looking around for things rather than just plonk click I call it ABL or always be looking you know there was a movie with Al Pacino and uh, Alec Baldwin and a lot of others. I think it was called Glengarry Ross. And, you know, he, he had that one scene where he's teaching the sales guys how to see. And it's ABC, always be closing, always be closing. And, you know, as a photographer, I try to help my uh, attendees always look back, always look at your feet, you know, put the long lens on and explore and find something. You know, there's so many things that because we're attuned to what the iconic shot is that we miss the individual pictures, you know, that are out there and available because we want to have that, that same picture everybody else has. So it's okay. Can't, you know, capture that so you can take it home and say, Hey, you know, I sat at that same spot. Yeah, I did this. But also, but, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, so, yeah, I mean, but... it's, as long as you're taking pictures and you're enjoying and you're finding your shot, it's okay. But, you know, you really got to, you know, have the ability to, you know, see differently and train your eyes to look deeper into the image, you know, turn around and find out what's behind well, it's, you. Well, it's funny you say that. So one of the, um, in fact, one of the guys that got me very much flipped across into landscape stuff, ironically, he used to shoot models and he, he converted me to landscape, but um, it, was a, it was a guy called Scott Mars um, in San Francisco. He, you know, he passed away a few years ago, unfortunately, but the best piece of advice he ever told me and I'll, I'll, and i always stick with it and always tell everyone that comes across um our paths in that sense is literally remember at any one point in time that half the world is behind you and and you see it at these locations where you know a sunset is a perfect example yes you can look into the sunset and and look amazing but half the time behind the sunset what's going on over there is even more spectacular that's where the pink sky is happening that's where all the reflections of that light are happening on the mountain tops and all that so you've got 50 photographers painting or facing that way and hoping for something better and what's better is guys guys there um but no one does it because they're just concentrating you know concentrating on that's the shot i want to get 
uh, a workshop in Australia that I did of Uluru Rock you're familiar with it. So we're all lined up photographing the rock. It's glowing red sunset. And, you know, I look behind me and these clouds are just, I don't know how you call them, like little bowling ball clouds or something. It's just remarkable. And it, they're all orange. And, you know, if you walk 50 more feet, there's one lone tree and you have a whole different picture. <clears throat> and, you know, everybody was saw the rock and nobody turned around. And when I looked around and turned around, I said, look behind us. And, oh, look over here. And I ran over and everybody runs over and, you know, it gets the shot. But it's a good lesson if you can find the opportunity to show that is that, you know, uh, you, you got that shot. How many, more, how many more exposures do we need to do that one? Look at this one over here. The, the irony with it is a lot of landscape photographers, and certainly a lot of the guys that we teach, want to, want to hone their skills on long exposure. Now, there's, there is something to be said for keeping an eye on what's going on in front of your camera, for sure. But I'm looking at guys that are doing two-minute exposures. And what happens is they, they click the button and they just watch for two minutes. And I'll say to them, what, what, are, you, what, what are you watching for? They, they, I, I get it. That maybe, maybe a cruise ship is going to go in front of Ayers Rock. I doubt it. But, you know, some, there's, there's very few things that are going to happen right now that are going to affect what you're doing with the camera. So use that time turn around look look around look at what's it think about what you want to shoot next not the same shot again but what what's coming what, what are you going to do next and it, it's you know especially if you're shooting long exposures over an hour what are you going to do 10 different shots so what are you doing for the other 55 minutes when you're not actually manipulating the camera controls look around that's that's amazing time to spend oh, yeah. um, no. but we don't it's not because, unusual, again we're fixated on yeah I've left cameras sitting on a tripod over a cliff, you know, doing the time exposure and went out with the, uh, you know, uh, the, the spare camera and uh, a lens and, you know, keep my eye on the camera because you don't want somebody kicking it off or something. But, you know, there's some a lot of stuff that you can do in 50 minutes while the sun and the light is just right that you're trying to catch with the other camera. You don't have to babysit it. So anyway, you know, there's a lot of things we learn, and, you know, especially for us that go out in the field a lot, see in the field. Oh God, do I want to go back out the field again? I'm so pent up. And you got at least six or seven more months of this, you know? Last week I booked my first flight um anywhere. Um to You're go brave. Uh, to go somewhere and, and shoot. And on the basis that the flights are completely flexible, the hotel's completely flexible, e everything is completely changeable. But it, it was weird. Um it's the first time and, and actually to the point where I would be booking flights every week, you know, normally. And I had to think about like, mm, what do I need? What ticket type do I need? And what do I, because it's been four or five months of just nothing. And for the first time I was like, I need to get back into this. I need to somehow get the, get the cogs going again, because this needs to just not be nothing. Like, yeah, for, if you're like me, you probably time. have a system for packing your clothes, you know, you know, yep. this is what I need. This is what I need. I put them in yep. cubes. I know how to do everything. Uh, you know, I've got, I'd, uh, you know, a I'd toiletry you, kit set aside. I got power cords and everything's, you know, put um, in its own little thing and just, uh, you know, I can load up my duffel and be on the road in no time at all. You know, and it's like, so this is, this is really bad. What I'm going to tell you, um, I have on, in, on average about three or four of everything. And as in, I've got like 25 tubs of shower gel and all that sort of stuff. Um, <laughs> I, I got to the point once where um, I was doing back to back through Heathrow. So I think I, I can't remember. It was like a US and then back to Heathrow and then an Australia and back to Heathrow and then an India back to Heathrow and then finally a China back to Heathrow. And it had to be done that way. Don't get me wrong. Carbon footprint, horrendous. We, we offset it. We do all of the good stuff that you're supposed to. But looking at it, it was, it was so inefficient. But because it was for different clients we had to do it in that way because of the way that the, the bookings came in. Um, so my car was at Heathrow airport the whole time. And what was happening is I was landing in the Heathrow, dumping one North Face bag into the back of my car, picking up the next pre-packed one for the next trip, go away, come back, putting that one back in the car, picking up the next one that's labeled for India, come back. But, and I, I remember getting in the car when it was all finished and thinking, what is wrong with you? This is ridiculous. Um, and then, as I say, you go from that to I'm, I was almost nervous booking a flight for the right reasons, but it's it's just weird that everything has changed overnight. I think our, I think as humans, we're going to have the hard time and, you know, discussing this with my wife last night. You know, I think the realization that, you know, this isn't going to end soon and that we've done three or four months of it and we've got probably six or seven more months of it to go at least before, yeah. you know, a vaccine shows up or 
you know, something happens. Um, well, we, yeah, and, we hope. <laughs> yeah, we hope. I mean, there's good promise there. So I'm, I'm trusting the, the news sources from that side of things that things are looking good and, you know, that the first trials are, are shaping up. Because I think that's the only way that, you know, I'll be able to convince 60 people to get on a ship to go to Antarctica again. Um, but nevertheless, it's, you know, uh, be, yeah, get, we're, we got to try to be safe and I'm, I'm willing to use this time for doing other things. And so, yeah. you know, as, as we're doing other things, what have you been doing uh, specifically? Obviously, if you're gone 251 days a year, you're home. If you got a cat, the cat's probably asking you to leave. If you've got a dog, the dog's probably happy you're home. Yeah. Vic, Vic, my partner, is kind of asking me to leave at the moment. <laughs> the broad answer is we've been doing a lot of stuff online. So from a, and I, I guess to separate the two out. So from a business point of view, frankly, we just wind a few things down. Um, so things like workshops, we've pushed them all out to 2021, as I'm sure everyone else has done. Um, we, you know, that's, that's a challenge in itself, but the good news is where the whole world is in it together, things like hotel bookings and flood bookings can be moved and stuff like that. So, um, to be honest, there was probably about two or three solid weeks worth of just admin. When, when this all sort of started, it sure. was just a case of, right, all of this stuff that we juggle all the time has now got to change completely. Um, so that, that was a, a big chunk. Um, but in the background, um, so I do a lot of work um, with the guys at Phase 1 and Capture 1. So with Capture 1, I'm, I'm one of their ambassador um, team, whatever. And um, I was talking to them at the very beginning of this, um, a, a friend of mine, David Grover, um, who's, who's quite good well chap, known. Good chap, good chap. I've, worked, I've done tutorials yeah, he's, he's, with him. Yeah, um, he's he's a good guy. Um, every now and then he's he's right, but there we go. Um, so, <laughs> no, I, he, he and I get on very well. But we um, we we talked about at the very beginning um, the fact that when when Capture One are doing their sessions, there there's a it has to be a short, sharp sort of quick thing. It has to be a known demo. Right. It has to be almost the marketing approach. Whereas what I could do. Um, given that I've got a huge amount of time on my hands all of a sudden, is help people with stuff that they're struggling with directly. Yeah, yeah. So rather than a sort of follow along, we could actually do the whole send your image in, we'll have a look at it together and, and we'll we'll broadcast it. So I think we started that back in March um, and effectively we took a YouTube channel from zero up to around 5,000 subscribers and stuff like that pretty quickly. Um, and that basically has become a little bit of an editing club. Um, and and there's part of it that you sort of look at it and think, are you, you, you know, are you giving all your secrets away and all that sort of stuff? But in reality, no, um, you know, there aren't really any secrets. It's the same with taking a photo, taking a good photo. You know, if you get if you get all your buttons right, then you're going to take a good photo. The trick is seeing the light properly or getting in the right place at the right time. Well, that sort of stuff is not the actual mechanics and same with editing. So it's not necessarily about knowing what all the tools do, which I can help people with. It's about knowing the right recipe for that particular shot. Um, so we've, we've basically been doing sort of live streams once or twice a week, um, helping, well, looking at the list, a huge number of people with with stuff that they were stuck on um, and stuff that, you know, they, it, it wasn't, it's stuff that's not worth their time to go on a week's long expedition with me to, to somewhere far east or whatever, but it was something that was niggling away and, you know, a reason that they used to find Capture One difficult or a reason that was holding them back from, from trying something new. Um, so that's, that's actually been great um, with the fact that we've, we've, we've been doing that. Um, and then in the background, um, what we have done is, so I've actually got to do some filming um, next week up um, with the, the print guys. Um, we've genuinely just been focusing on how do we do print better? Um, so things like, you know, and it's becoming standard on a lot of the stock sites, um, as in the, the, the template sites, but we don't have a template website. It's all sort of us in that sense. Um, so we built in some augmented reality into it. Um, we built in some new um, abilities to buy and stuff, um, which we didn't have before. We've spent some time now with the the guys that hand make um, the frames that I I use. Um, we've we sort of tweaked some of the ways of doing things, and, it, and frankly, it's all stuff that, in hindsight, we should have always been doing. But you you get wrapped up in what's going on, and all of a sudden, it was like I'm forced to not you know I'm not creating new content on any massive scale right now. So what about all the other stuff that you've been saying for ages? Oh, one day we'll look at that. Well, okay, here's one day. Get on. Yeah, with we're it. we're kind of the same way. Sometimes you get so far into the forest, you're 
<laughs> you really can't see the trees anymore. And then you find out, well, you know, now that I'm out here in the meadow, I see a lot of stuff that we can be doing here. And, you know, we're, we're, we're finding the same sort of thing here. Um, and actually, from a customer point of view, I, this is going to sound a little bit glib, I guess, but th there is a positive out of this whole situation that's come along, which is what I'm looking at is over the last two or three years, and I, I use this phrase very carefully, but there's an element of complacency that sort of forms in any business, because if, it, if it's doing OK and, and everything's running fine and running smooth, you end up almost in autopilot because everything's sure. OK. When that customer base faces some challenges, which obviously we've we've had now, I mean, UK number of people being or losing their jobs is, is horrendous at the moment. That's putting a squeeze on wallets, that's putting a squeeze on discretionary spend, all, all the other stuff that goes around the, the those sort of um, topics. That then makes you have to react and it make, makes you wake up to actually there are things that we could do better because it's now every well, pound slash dollar is more difficult to chase. And it will be, as you say, for for a while, it's not it's not just all of a sudden everything's going to release and off we go. This is going to be a long slog. So having a business that's looked at itself and then said, OK, what can we do better? How can we attract customers better? How can we keep customers happy and whatever, even though we're not able to service them in the way that we would do normally? All of those things, they're not bad things to do anyway. In fact, it's a, it's been a good opportunity to look at that stuff. Um, it's just, I wish we'd done it in different circumstances, but. For sure. Well, I think, you know, this is, there's, there's at least you're smart enough to actually realize that these, these things and know that you need to change where so many people are looking at them and go, oh my God, you know, they're not willing to make the difference. They're not willing to recognize what needs to be changed and, you know, what it's going to take to survive. Um, you know, I've yeah. been in business long enough, probably reinvented myself, you know, a dozen times at least. And I think that's, you know, where we're at here. Now that we know we're in this yeah. particular yeah. situation, you know, we've got to kind of start, you know, doing some things uh, to, to react accordingly. Obviously for yeah. you and me, we, you know, we, we've launched our 2021 workshops with the hope that the pent up demand, if, the, if it gets safe to do workshops again, will, you know, automatically, yeah. uh, <laughs> kick in and uh, we'll have a good year next year, um, which I'm counting on. Yeah, I mean, and my, my hope, my genuine hope is that, I know I've already had sort of emails from people that are chasing for stuff for next year and, and the approach that they have still right now is still very positive. It's, it's more appreciative of travel. It's more that this is a luxury and a privilege rather than a right. And, that, and I'm hoping that that continues for a while because do you know, genuinely, it, it's nice to get um, to start working on a, an itinerary with with people that are sat thinking, do you know what, this is going to be a privilege if we get to be able to do this. Yeah, I think it's there's going to be a lot outlook. of thankfulness. Yep, yep. There's yeah. no question about that. And I think, yeah. you know, we, we, none of this is going to come back full strength, just like turn the switch on and it's back where it was. I mean, we're into going to be years of recovery and years of new life. Uh, yeah. Just because we have a vaccine doesn't mean we're not going to be, you know, charging around with a mask. And for all these years that we looked at, you know, the pictures we saw of Asia where everybody walks around with masks all the time going, we wonder why they're doing that. That's kind of weird. And realize it's not so weird now. You know, yeah, they've had to, they've had these issues for a lot longer, maybe not on the scale that you know, we're seeing it these days. So um, I want to move on to a couple quick things. Let's while we're still on yeah. Capture One, let me ask you, you know, OK, you use Capture One. Um, I'm sure you probably tried Lightroom along the way. What is it about Capture One that um, keeps you where it is? How, how does it benefit you and your business? So the the initial answer, if I go back to when I first switched across to phase one, is that Lightroom couldn't answer or couldn't open phase one files. So so that, that was what drew me um, because I needed Capture One to be able to open it. And I think if I'm actually, if I'm brutally honest, um, when I first started shooting and made the switch across to phase one kit, I would still edit my old Canon files in Lightroom. And I, I would literally, cause, because it felt like home, it was, it's what I'd used forever. And that's the whatever. hardest part for people. Yeah. Um, and, and it probably took me probably two or three years, if I'm honest, to actually move all of the activity across to the point where I don't have Lightroom installed. Well, I, I do for workshop stuff, but for, for myself, we don't use it. Um, 
So I think, you know, I, I was pushed into it because of the hardware decision is, is number one. However, um, you know, I've, I've done over the years a lot of side by side comparisons where we've loaded up the same image in Lightroom. Same, and everyone's done that, you know, let's, let's compare the two pieces of software. Generally speaking, what I found is Capture One, A, Capture One's workspace, I can mold around me. Um, whereas you know, Light, Lightroom is great because it's a it's a cookie cutter approach to to everything, and and generally speaking, people will follow the flow that Adobe have, have set up for for everyone to do. My workspace in Capture One is probably unlike anyone else's because it's focused on the tools that I need and not anything else. Um, so my my workflow in terms of Capture One is is pretty um, pretty quick. It's funny every every time there's an upgrade, you're like, please don't lose my workspace, please don't lose oh, my yeah, workspace, yeah, yeah. and it's fine, it's all good. But I can I can recreate those workspaces so quick now. Matter of fact, I think what I'm going to do is an article soon on to, on the workspaces I use and share them on my site. And at least you have a Mac, you can download it and go to it. You know? Yeah, and it's that sort of stuff that, um, and so there's a couple of things. One is is that that from an ease of use point of view, and actually from a from a technical ability to do stuff very quickly, I find it far better. Yep. Um, the output results when I have done side by sides, um, you know, don't get me wrong, Lightroom has some great tools in it as well. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not, I don't think Lightroom is a bad tool. I just think that when it comes to creating natural results, that Capture One tends to do it a bit better. Um, and, and it's fun, for me to say that is a bit weird because a lot of the stuff that I shoot is cities and neon lights and all that stuff. And we do we do make the city glow, but I need it to glow in a believable way, not in the sort of, for want of a better phrase, Instagram way. It, it needs to feel like you're in that city, not looking at a cartoon. Um, and I find that it's really easy to do that in Capture One, whereas in Lightroom, it's really easy to go over the top. Um, it is. I mean, Lightroom is good if, if you know, you, you're working with a fixed environment and it's probably a, a good place where many photographers start. Um, yeah, it, it gets you, know, you clear can, on these. This is the process that, that yeah, works. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a, but once you get to the point where you wish you had this, or you wish you had that, or I don't need that, um, it, you, you begin to really go. And, and of course, it's like Photoshop. I mean, with the luminosity layers that Capture One has now, Mm -hmm. The word luminosity scares a lot of people because they don't quite understand yeah. what it means. And, you know, they're discovering it more and more each day. But once you start looking at this, I'm finding uh, with Capture One that I hardly ever go into Photoshop to do anything. I can do most of that kind of work and most of the work that I need to do, you know, on the raw file using Capture One right now. And having <laughs> worked at phase one for 13 years, and even to this date, I still bitch at them a lot sometimes. Like, you know, for example, and I'm sure you might share the same issue. They've got a great keystone tool or a parallel tool or, you know, whatever you want to call it, upright tool, depending on where you're coming from. And, you know, you're so going to say, why do I have to hunt the dots? Where is it? Like, come on. <laughs> why why no, can't you give me in a preference larry i want a three or four pixel dot because you know you line them up with a brick building and they blend right into the edge them. and you can, well, i can't even see the damn thing you yeah. know the circles could be red so that you know when you're dragging the corners to where you want them i mean what does that take before and after they just put the before and after tool in and, you know, I bitched and moaned about that. I said, if you want to bring people from Lightroom over, you're going to need a before and after. And, uh, you know, well, you can use control, option, click, shift, boom. I said, well, why don't I put a switch in? I don't want to do keys. Put a switch in there where I can do it. I'll tell you what, on before and after, I'll tell you a funny story. Um, just, just from the online sort of forums. The whole, um, you could option and reset. So that, that was the way that you could do before and after. Effectively, it's, it's not quite before and after, but you could option reset. So um, they released the before and after tool back in uh, May. Um, that was with 20.1. Um, so everyone gets really excited about it. But to do it, they do, they removed the option reset that everyone complained about before. Now all the forums are like, why did you remove my option reset? <laughs> they're like, well, oh. Um, so the, the problem is people, it's, it's change, isn't it? People, we, it as humans, well, we it's always like change. a change part. Um, and you know, I think the you know the only other thing that I have a bitch about, and not that I would use it, but I know that I take people on the workshop and they go, well, it doesn't have history. What? Yeah, I want to have a history panel or 
And I said, well, you know, I've never used history in my whole life. I mean, you know, I can just. I, I hear the request a, a bit. I think. But I, th I think that there is a there is a one of the nuances of Capture One, and, and and it's still to this day relevant. You know, Capture One has grown in popularity by an amazing amount oh, yeah, uh, over the last it's, few years. Yep. Um, but the, there's all the sense that, and if you look at it, you know, it's still a relatively small team in Denmark that put all this stuff together. It's still a couple of product managers and all that sort of stuff, and they're really keen to hear from users. So. I know, I, I know, having spoken quite a bit on it, one of their big frustrations is people will sit at home and say, why can't it do this? Why can't it do that? Why is this broken? Whatever. And then you, because I do it on, on our live sessions, every now and then we'll get someone saying, you know, why doesn't it do this? And I say, okay, so that sounds like a bug. Have you reported it? No. Well, so the chances are they might not even know that they, A, it's a bug, or B, you want it to do something. And, and it's one thing that I know the team get frustrated by because they are still a very active team and they want feedback and and things like feature requests and stuff will only really happen of course they have their own roadmap but if it's something that a lot of users want they'll prioritize it but only if they know a lot of users want it well um, so you know i know so yeah, many people there that i can drop the emails when that happens yeah. but you know you're absolutely right you know if, if, but i don't know if you get the same thing but i probably get half a dozen letters or emails a week going hey you know uh, every time I start Capture One, it, it automatically goes to the import dialog box. It's doing this, it's doing that. <sighs> like I'm tech support, you know, like I should know the answers yeah. all the time. Well, you become the Sometimes button. it's and... easy to say, well, do you have a camera attached to it or something? Well, yeah, I do. Well, then you've got to, it, it's seeing the camera and going, well, I guess you want to import. So, you know, you either got to, you know, say ignore, and there's a way to do that, or you know, unplug the camera. And actually, where I sort of where I come from with it is it certainly for our workshop clients. I have no problem. You know, frankly, I be I become almost tech support forever from from that point because you know we we build a very good relationship with people and actually in part because I want to help them do it. So if it means that I become the buffer um, in that, then great. But I, I guess what they don't necessarily see is when I get um, a constant stream of the same sort of request. All I'm doing in the background is effectively sending that in to, to Capture One to say, guys, by the way, I'm hearing a lot of this. Yeah, that's um, what I do. Um, and, and that helps act as a conduit. It, yeah, but it's, it's always more, what would be more helpful is the 20 original reports rather than, oh, Paul says that this is a problem. That's something, you know, David should do or somebody, you know, when they do the tutorials, eventually everybody always stumbles upon one of his tutorials. You know, at the end, hey, if you have any issues, questions and features, you know, here's a link down below, click on that and send it to us. We read them all, you know, and, but you know, their, their knowledge base is getting better on Capture One since they kind of separated, they, they need, needed some time to fix some things, but um, their support and everything looks like it's getting a lot better these days. You know, bottom line is, you know, you and I both depend on Capture One. I'm waiting for a Capture One app. I think that would be the heyday of everything. Um, well, the, there is an argument that says, if you're gonna have to code Capture One for ARM anyway, you may as well put it onto the existing ARM processes that are out there. Uh, so, and, and you know, they're like poker faces. When I sit in these meetings after you know signing NDAs, and then I start asking questions, um, Klaus Molgard, who used to be in charge of their equipment there, you know, the hardware design before Lau, he was always one of those guys where I love to get him because he he would have as a poker guy would say he's got to tell. You know, you can tell on his face, and his eyes would twitch or his smile would come, or you get that question. Oh, so you'd like that? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and so you can usually tell what was coming and how it was going to be and so forth. Uh, they're great guys. There's nothing like a good Dane. And I'm sure you've had many opportunities to go over there and, you know, uh, be drunk under the table by them. They, they love to drink you to death. <laughs> it, it takes a lot. It takes a lot to get me, but they've, they've done it. Um, so, um, <laughs> There's, but I, they're I masters I'm, I'm, at it. They, they are. Um, but I think the, the, the key for me you know, on your question of, you know, Lightroom versus Capture One. In, in part, you know, I, I don't think Capture One necessarily does 100% of what everyone needs. I, for me, just like you, it probably does 90, 95%. Every now and then I need to go into a pixel editor of some sort, um, do a couple of finishing things. But, you know, with every release, it's getting better. The new heel brush is getting better and so on. The difference for me is I, they still feel to me like a group of people that take note of their customers and will will accommodate that if it's a reasonable request or a reasonable bug or whatever else. I don't get that feeling from Adobe anymore. 
No, no, Adobe, you know, and I know the guys at Adobe and have a lot of friends at Adobe, Eric and, and Thomas, you know, they're all great friends of mine, been, you know, many places with them. Um, I know they really care about their product, but I think also, you know, the corporate structure and Adobe. It's scale as well. Yeah, it's, it's <laughs> somewhat, there's, there's too many people the decisions need to go through to get something done, you know, where in phase, you know, one of the engineers buys a Fuji camera many years ago and goes, God, this is different. I'm going to figure out how to make this work because I want to shoot with this camera. And, you know, they ended up making some of the best, you know, decoding for the, uh, uh, the screwy XT uh, or the X sensor yeah. kind of thing. And, you know, they've <laughs> the done X-Trans wonders. With it. It, was, you know, it was really yeah. amazing. And I think that's part of, you know, the passion that those guys have over there. And having been part of the team, we were all embedded with that passion. It started at the top. You know, Henrik is the, the CEO at the time. And, you know, he just drove everything and you know challenged everything and said here's an envelope see how far you can how much stuff you can put in it before it bursts open and stuff you know so it was always trying to you know go above what you know was expected or go above what the specs were and figure out a way to you know to pass those and set new well it, it's, it's the difference isn't it between you know the the philosophy of let's see what it can do versus let's see what we have to do yeah let's wait, um, keep pushing it till it breaks yeah <laughs> Yeah, and it's it, it's well, it's kept them in good stead so far. And yeah, from my point of view, as as the user, um, whether it's software or hardware, from from my point of view, great because they're always just one more ahead. Um, but you know, and I, I think that I think that mentality is there to stay. I, I think that's part of the ingrained sort of um, Danish approach to it, which is let's just let's just do it better. Before we get off of software, you know, there's some third party programs that I use. Curious to see what you do. As you said, you can do pretty much 90% or maybe more of what we want done in Capture One. But, you know, I have the reserve now. I've been, I'm using the Topaz tools, the, the new NIC tools, and Luminar. And, you know, though, those allow you sometimes maybe just uh, for the social media aspect of things because you can do some cool things with them. There's some re- remarkable stuff going on, both in Luminar and with Topaz, with the AI um, capability. I think, um, so to me, I, in terms of the tools, so in, in terms of what have I got installed, frankly, every single bit of software that I think has ever been, if you want to make money, promote a bit of software to me and I'll buy it. That's unfortunately one of my <laughs> downsides. We're suckers, um, aren't we? So, so they're, they're all on there and I'll, I'll play with them. But I think, um, you know, for me, the I am morally very unimpressed with Luminar, um, purely from the, the, the use of, uh, I love this phrase, you know, sky replacement tool. I'll, I'll be honest, that just pees me off. Because, and it, again, it goes back to that whole thing about, are you there to get the postcard shot? Are you, or are you there for the experience? And if, if you're saying basically, I want those clouds with those stars and that moon and that landscape and this rock, go go learn to paint. Because you're not capturing something, you're you're, you're playing. With it. And, and don't get me wrong, I think the technology behind it is is fantastic. I've, I've looked. Uh, at that's it. part I think what you have to admire. Yeah, yeah, and that's where I'm at. the the sort of the the ex geek in me or, or current geek, I guess, in that sense, looks at it and thinks this is phenomenal what they're doing. But then, from a photography point of view, I, I and it's a personal thing, but I struggle with that with that approach. Yeah, but as a photographer too, you know, and I'm sure you've shot plenty of skies that are white. And, you know, against buildings and other things. Now, you know, I don't want to use their canned uh, skies. I always had a catalog of my own and I always did sky replacement the hard way. And what yeah, I am amazed I, about is how how easily Luminar sky replacement A, I, and how good it is. I mean. Yeah, uh, but and I think, I, I think that, I think that's where the, the challenge comes from, for why are you shooting? Because, um, you know, don't get me wrong. If, if I'm gonna, if if we're doing a commercial shoot and you know you've got two days to do it, I'd, I'd have one in um, September. We were we were out in Mauritius shooting for a hotel. The weather was awful. Um, you know, it was it was just bad timing and whatever else. We got the shots we wanted done. Could have used some of the replacement stuff. In the end, we didn't need it. But at the very beginning, I was sat thinking, if this doesn't get better soon, we're gonna have to think about different ways of doing this. But, and that's from a commercial perspective, then I go on to sort of my, when I go out and shoot for print, I've had, you know, I've I've got a shot of um, the Golden Gate Bridge, which I tried to get for about, I think it was like nine years or something like that. Um, 
and you know i i fly to california a lot um or flew in past tense to yeah, california yeah. a lot um and I, I must have, I don't know how many trips I did at, at stupid o'clock in the morning, driving up that damn hill and trying to get it. And, and to an extent, it's the postcard shot and whatever. But the more and more of a fail I got with each trip, the more I wanted to get it. I hear you. And it and and that to me is, is one of these driving things. And, and to me, then the, the prospect of, well, I didn't get what I wanted. So I'll go back to the, the hotel room and just click the button instead. I, it, that takes a huge chunk away from me of, of the, that entire process. I, I, I don't disagree with you at all. But I, I think, as we said, from a technology point, though, you really oh, have to realize, you know, what's happened. And, you know, even that augmented sky, not that I want to bring a moon in and, you know, Santa Claus, you know, driving a sleigh across the, the, the sky. But the fact that you can do something you know, along oh, and, those lines. Yeah, you know, going back to you, you said yourself. You know, you, you've you've done it the hard way in the past. You know, I have. Everyone's done it at some point. But what they're doing isn't just we'll replace the sky. It's changing the mood of the entire photograph. Oh, yeah, with they all can the relight change it. in lighting and everything, and, yeah. and it, it's stunning. So that from that sense, you know, great. Um, for me, Topaz, um, I've had mixed results with it. So um, what I would say on on phase one files, Gigapixel delivers horrendous artifacts. Um, really big, it, it struggles with ultra high res files. Um, it and, may and do I, I've that. even, I, yeah, yeah I, I tried the latest one um, because I, what someone from there actually emailed me saying we want you to try. Their denoise um, has worked really well, and it's an updated version. Denoise is good. Um, yeah, denoise is good. Sharpen, it's funny. Sharpen actually can rescue a file if you're if you're slightly out. So from that perspective, great. Um, but you know the the, the flagship because recently I've done it in the US, but in the UK they certainly on social media they've been really spearheading Gigapixel as a as a, a flagship product, and and I was hoping that it had got markedly better, but it it, it didn't quite hit the mark. The one I was really surprised at, if I'm honest, um, out of out of the sort of let's call it new breed of of, of apps. So, you know, Photoshop I've used for many decades, but enough now. Um, Things like, you know, there, there are specialist tools like Helicon for focus stacking and stuff, which frankly, I, I haven't found one better. So for me, Helicon, if, if there's a focus stack um, out of capture, around one, it's Helicon that gets used. Um, but the one that I was really surprised at was someone actually asked me a, a, a couple of weeks ago, or no, a couple of months ago now, cool, time flies. <laughs> um, the the stitching function in, so obviously Capture One doesn't have um, stitching of panoramas. Um, Photoshop does, Lightroom does. And I had this one shot of Yosemite that um, I was playing with and could never quite get it right. And then someone emailed me saying, um, you know, I'm really struggling with pano stitching. Do you have a recommended piece of software? And I was, I was halfway through typing back saying, yeah, just use Photoshop. And then it, it dawned on me, actually, I've got a shot that doesn't work in Photoshop. For, for, for some reason, it just couldn't quite get it. And, and it was actually a shifted shot. So it wasn't like it was difficult to, to map the, the sphere or anything. Um, and I loaded it into Affinity, so Affinity Photo, yeah, and that's... their pano stitch did it 99% in seconds, and as in, you know, 100% better than Photoshop had, had ever tried. Um, and I loaded this thing up, and and you know when you try and find the joins, you know, there's always that pixel thing of like, where, where is it? There's got to be one. I couldn't fault it. And and since then, someone else actually, funnily enough, put on their Facebook a, a friend of mine. Um, she had a, a picture in, I think it was Death Valley. Um, I think it was. Anyway, um, how can I stitch this? And I said to her, just give that affinity photo. There's a free trial thing. So give it a, give it a try. And she messaged me back saying, that's amazing. Yeah, actually, um, so affinity is quite just nice, actually. Is a, a yeah, it is. It's pretty cool. It Very powerful little um, application. And yeah, uh, they have a great book that's, you know, yay thick about how to use it and, you know, focus in on it. So it's another one of those tools that are out there. And um, yeah, and, and I think where if you look at it in terms of again, it's a, it's a bit like the light Lightroom versus Capture One, although it's not really versus, but in the same sort of thing with this, which is Photoshop now is so many things to so many different people. It has to cater for so many different genres of, of yep. um, art and design that it it becomes slow, to almost by in nature, not not in terms of how fast it works, but in terms of trying to find stuff and trying to do stuff and it becomes 90% good at stuff rather than 100 whereas some of these new guys 
they're so focused on getting you know the photography editing stuff and the stitching stuff and you know, right to be fair the sky replacement stuff if you're purely focused on that you do it really well and that's what they've that's what they've, they've, done. they've done but it's also photoshop as much as we love it, it uh, i mean it's and you can do things six different ways it is not intuitive and um you know you uh, even somebody that's been around you know since the, the first photoshop i still struggle with it there's day where i can what am i doing wrong and you know you can't for the life of you figure it out until you you know you got to kind of go away from it and come back and go okay maybe i should look up in the upper left and see what is up there in that bar there and then you find out oh why did they do that no it just yeah and you know you, some, I, some of this stuff as well is just just longevity of a, of a product and you, you know you, you touched on it there but um perfect example for me if i load in one of my files um in 16 bit out of the um, rq4 the second i have more than two layers in photoshop i can't save the file anymore it has to go to a psp it has to go into a, a large format because in every layer it's saving everything every layer is an entire layer you know the that's called the new guys well they've looked at it from the ground up and it doesn't it saves the changes on every layer so a it's non-destructive as a pixel editor which to photoshop people is like huh um so you, you've got that ability but b your file sizes are so much smaller because it's not storing a copy of everything every time i i add a slight change to a, a tone or something on there and even with some of the masking stuff that you can do in photoshop it's still big file bases because that was how you always used to do it yeah and now the world has moved on we're hitting two gig limits all the time all the time. photography all the time and and they're just not there yet they're not ready for it um whereas the other guys they are i think they're hearing a lot about it lately so hopefully maybe we'll see something in the future um let's let's move on to uh, i got two other things i would like to you know catch and talk to you about a little bit about hardware and then um, what i consider the most important aspect of photography the print so let's talk a little bit about the hardware you use i mean we're we're in an age that even in a pandemic we're seeing new cameras coming out from canon and we've seen olympus going away i mean wow you talk about a, a camera industry that's in flux and uh you know um, you you you're using phase one gear i think you said you had two phase one yeah systems. yeah um i mean uh, yeah so i have um i have the, the big boy the the xf uh, which is the let's call it commercial all-rounder um, and that to be honest I went from 645 across to XF so you know that that's always been my um, my big DSLR if, if you want to call it that um, in, you know, in theory medium format has always been mirrorless but in, in practice it's it's been a mirror-based camera for a long time um, and to be honest um, it it's funny working with the guys um, in Denmark um, for a long time we had the conversation about tech cameras um about me switching to tech cameras because for the type of photography i was doing maybe it was better it gave me more options or whatever and and if i'm honest um i used to look at them and think that thing looks scary um it's got all these levers and, and dials and i remember the the original was it the phase one um a series the alpha one um yeah. that was there um and I remember the shutter was like a syringe for for a, for a hospital yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and stuff like that. And, and you just look at it. And, and I remember sort of thinking a lot of the photography I do is on the edge of a roof. Um, luckily, I'm quite well grounded. So that sort of that, uh, helps with that style. But um, if I've got to be leaning over on the 72nd floor to try and change the aperture and stuff, because I don't want to move the composition and stuff like that, that's, that just doesn't feel good. That just feels overly complex. So I always stuck with XF. Um, and then uh, back when was it, 20, end of 2018 um, sort of time, we started talking about could there be something that would come along that would give me access to the tech cam um, series of lenses, so better glass, on the same digital back that, that's amazing, so the, the 150 um, IQ4, so 151 megapixels, it's a full frame medium format camera. The blue ring lenses that go on the XS system are phenomenal compared to what I can ever get near to on, a, on any other sort of DSLR system. But there's still one better, which is if you then go to the Rodenstock end of, of, of glass, you're on a, yeah, exactly, you're on, you're on a different planet. And, and the problem is that was always out of 
out of reach for me because I was using XF. And then they brought out so this one, the baby, the XT, um, which now is my landscape camera. So if I if I want to control flash and if I want to do some of the stuff like automated focus stacking and all that stuff, then XF is the go to for sure. Um, it, it does some of that stuff amazingly. Um, it will always be my go to camera if I need a, a, a an all rounder in that sense. But if I'm going somewhere that I intend to shoot, you know, tack sharp, ultra iris, but more importantly, considered landscapes or considered cityscapes, um, not where I need to turn up and think, oh, maybe I'll try this lens, maybe I'll try that one, but where I've actually, you know, really hunkered down and planned for it, then this one is the one that's in my bag. And it's, it, I mean, it's it, don't get me wrong, it's not lightweight. No, it's not. Um, in, no, in the sense it's that it, it's not a camera phone, but compared to XF, this is your travel one. Um, you know, the bag that it needs and whatever is a lot smaller. And, and it's things like, and it's not just that. So things like with the, the tech camera systems, if you think about every layer of complexity, so if the phase one cameras are, you know, they're, they're certainly not cheap. They're, they're an investment um, if you're going to go down that road. Um, and I remember when I first switched across to, to medium format back in, I don't know, it was 2012, 2013, something like that. It was scary because you're almost having to relearn photography. For a start, all your calculations are wrong. They're, they're now different from 35 mil. But secondly, you know, I remember someone saying to me, what's the difference between 22 megapixels and 80 megapixels? And the answer I gave him was my mistakes are bigger. <laughs> um, and it, it, it's, it's, yeah. it's scary because you know you, you can't hide when you're at 80 or 100 or 151. Um, so it, that in itself was a big leap. And then you've got to, on top of, you know, and we do it in work, workshops, we're teaching people about filters, we're teaching people about long exposure stuff and, and, and shadow recovery and dynamic range and so on. And what the guys at phase one have done very well in the last couple of years is they've focused on the usability stuff. So you know, things like frame averaging, which is frankly um, amazing uh, in certain circumstances, you know, don't get me wrong, it's not the be all and end all for everything. But in the set of credit or set of scenarios that um, we would traditionally use just an ND filter, I don't need to carry two kilos of glass with me anymore. I can do that in the camera um, with the, the dual exposure plus stuff. So I've got 18 stops of dynamic range. In a you shot. know, people like people don't believe that, though. That's, you know, yeah. It's, yeah, I do, I do. Yeah, it's, <laughs> um, um, I, and, and actually, but that, but that's that, it's a fair point because it, they're all things that you know we've had ingrained into us that you know a camera can't possibly see as much as your human eye, and it's still you know eighteen stops still isn't at a human eye level, but you know we it's getting there, and you need a filter to do long exposure because that's ingrained into us because of the exposure triangle, and, and what the guys in Denmark have done certainly recently is. They started breaking those rules, not for the sake of breaking the rules, but removing the limitations. So if the, let's let the exposure triangle manage exposure and let me take time separately. You know, why should time have to be linked to exposure? Sure. And that's what frame averaging does. Yep. And and I'll be honest, when I remember sitting with um, Lau and Drew talking about frame averaging, and I remember all the words, but they didn't make sense. Oh, uh, I my their first because, explanation of it whizzed right over my head too. It's but like, it, but their explanation was perfectly fine. It was just ingrained in me. I know. It was, well, it's because well, no, it is that's, that's not how this works. Yeah. So, um, but then as you start to look at it and you think, actually, you know, this isn't just a bigger DSLR. This is a a frankly beast of a computer, and an amazing sensor and stunning glass that all together gives me, frankly, opportunities to capture stuff that I couldn't do with another camera. And that, that to me, is where the, the power comes into it. Because I know, if it's, it's that whole thing, if I'm in the right place at the right time, I know I've got the right kit to get the best that I could out of it. For sure. There's no risk that my kit's going to hold me back. So, and that's, well, that's 20, I think, the selling thing for me. Do you have the 23 millimeter lens? I, it's on it right now. Oh, that yep. lens, I got a story about that lens. I mean, I, I shot a concert hall with it and uh, most beautiful concert hall you can think of. A beautiful, you know, all the, the, the angles and all, everything kind of came at you from the balcony. It's a really good shot. And up in the top of the concert hall, there are, you know, the spotlights. And on the back of those spotlights, which are all remotely controlled, or a knob and, you know, a, a bright to dark and a couple other words and the serial numbers. So, you know, we, obviously spent a lot of time getting this thing composed, right? Making sure everything's perfect, you know, 
uh, the lights on the piano on the stage properly and everything is, you know, all set the way it is. And we made the shot look good. It's all in focus, you know, checked it on the camera, took it back and, you know, put it on the, uh, uh, iMac uh, 27 and, you know, went and looked at it and boy, tack sharp. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We ended up going making a 44 inch by 70 some odd inch roughly print, the widest my printer could make. And when we did that and looked at that spotlight, now because we were printing at 360, we were able to actually read the words on that spotlight. And Lau and Drew were with me and we got the magnifying glass out because right now the screens that we actually process and capture one on and you know even the best computers do not have the resolving power that the actual print does. So you really don't discover the, the real beauty of what's in one of those files and the sharpness and, until you do that. And, and you might remember with the old Alba backs, we had to shim them. I don't know if you ever went through the shimming process. Yeah, 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 yeah. And what a difference it made. I mean, I remember putting them back on the Alpha first time. Yeah, just that tiny like, little adjustment. Oh, it's like so good. And they go, did you shim it? No, nah, it's like dead on. No, no, shim it. Go through the shimming exercise. Holy like moly. You know, I that woke me up to just what a piece, a little flimsy piece of metal. I mean, you know, zero, 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 one you know, little inserts you would put in and then screw everything back together. What a difference that could make in, in the, the yeah. focus. So, I mean, literally the stuff is so crucial. Even, even XF. So, you know, they, they, they launched the focus trim um, function on it. And I took one of my lenses. So uh, one of my favorite lenses on, on 645 and XF, and even still to this day, is the 28. And the, the answer from a lot of people is, oh, it's, you know, it's, it's murky around the corners, it's soft, blah, blah, blah. I love that lens, um, in part because it's got a character to it. But um, I did some of the work, some work on focus trimming it properly. Um, the difference it made and, and things, you know, we're talking about sharpen, you know, Topo sharpen and stuff like that. What I found was quite often shooting with the 28, I would use not, not Topo actually, but other tools to try and just do the finer sharpening stuff. All it needed was a bit of trimming. Yeah. Um, and, and that difference of what you think is sharp until you see, oh, that's sharp. Um, and it's yeah, it, that, it's that one woke me up. And staggering sometimes. That's probably, though, I mean, because I use an Alpha to shoot this concert hall, uh, probably why that shot turned out so sharp. You know, and I used to do my alignments and everything on a, um, I guess it was a cell phone tower, maybe a quarter mile away when I did the, you know, the, the testing of it to, to set it up properly. and. Um, you know, when I could see the screws that were holding the, the antennas on, I realized, <laughs> man, it's pretty phenomenal that from a quarter mile away, you can see that kind of detail. You can't see the viewfinder. You can't even see it necessarily when it's, as you say, on the screen. And, and th uh, we did a session about a week ago um, with one of the partners because one of the questions, there was always that question, like, you know, who needs 151 megapixels? Well, you know, I could go back 10 years, you know, who, who needs 50? Sure. I could go back 20 years, like, who needs more than two megapixels? What are you, crazy? And then you get into, you know, why do you need more than 1.4 meg on a floppy disk? The reality is our, our desire to see more and more detail is not going to go away. It's going to get bigger. You've got 4K TVs, they go into 8K TVs, they'll get to 12K TVs pretty soon. Um, but to me, it's not necessarily purely about that. So the ability to zoom in and, and do it is great. But for me, commercially, it also gives me the ability to do, and you mentioned um, before when we were chatting, picture in picture sort of scenario. Um, you know, I can do that out of one image. So I've got 151 megapixel print that actually I might want to nuance it and take out a third, but I can still produce an amazing quality print yeah. from my two thirds of my image. <clears throat> what what amazes me about you know the 16 stop dynamic range, and you know um, when I do a landscape photo. Um, what I like to do is, you say I'm in the forest, I shoot a bunch of trees and, you know, there's fallen trees, there's a lot of detail. What I like is when I make a print, put it on the wall and somebody stands back from it for four feet and, you know, then they take a step forward and another step forward and they've got their nose. Yeah, they keep it. going. <laughs> and, you know, with the ability to retain the highlights and bring out details and shadows. And I always believed, you know, that the shadow is where the magic is, meaning, the ability to look into a shadow and see things that you can't see otherwise. Um, you know, a bright picture, you can't really see in the shadows. Your eyes are adjusting to uh, the bright side of things. But when you make this print, open up the shadows a bit, and it all still looks natural, but it's immersive imaging. So I, I think, you know, when you shoot with a phase, it's so much detail, 
and you make a big print and you know it's in a gallery or display or wherever it is and you watch the people walk up to it and almost have their nose in it discovering things you know it's immersive imaging steve wilkes and i don't know if you're familiar with his work does a, a series called data night and he uses a phase back and uh, it's really it. yeah. a marvelous yeah. amount of cool. detail and when you actually go up to one of his prints you, you you start exploring and you could be standing in front of this picture for 15 minutes and not see everything that you can imagine it's it's funny you mentioned that so uh, one of my one of my first things with um and actually it wasn't even the 150 it was the 80 megapixel back and we did a um uh, marketing campaign with sandisk um and it was a shot of new york now it was a what i consider quite a wide shot of new york i think it was you know, it was on the, what was it? I think 45, I think. Um, so 35 equivalent was sort of, what was that? About 28, 29, something like that. Um, and it was, it was a skyline shot. So no problem. I was about to send the file off and I just happened to be zoomed. And there were, there were some people in um, one of the windows doing things that you wouldn't want on a marketing campaign for them to be doing in the window. Um, so then and it's a funny enough it's a problem so so number one lesson to everyone um if you're staying in a hotel in the city close the curtains um but number two from a from a photographer's point of view we the high res you've got to check stuff that you didn't think about before you didn't think about the fact that you know you said you could you could read the text on that sign well what if the text isn't particularly nice you know and all of that stuff that there's this whole realm of new considerations when you're editing these files to make sure that actually, because everything's got to be right, because the beauty with those sort of files is you can, as you say, go up to your nose in detail, which means people will. Yep. And when they do, they can find stuff in true, the, in true the and actually there's part of it. True pixel but, but that's the great thing. So especially when you're shooting cities, what's amazing to me is within a city um, shot that we'll, we'll produce, there's all these little stories going on. In the city so there's there's the guy we've got a shot of vegas um where I've, I've, it's it's a pano shot um taken um out on a, a brief thing um and it it's got the whole it's got there's a sort of classic vegas strip view with all the hotels sort of lined up and whatever and down in the bottom corner there's this one little guy um i say guy it could be a, a woman i've got no idea but that's the point under this one street light in a parking lot and there's a little SUV lit up, illuminated. So everything around them is is dark, except for this one car that's illuminated, and it's looking out over the strip. And that you can't help but just think about it, like what is, what are they doing? What what what's that? What's that story there? Um, and then you look at, at the street, and there's sort of a couple holding hands, watching the Bellagio fountains and stuff like that. So there's another story, and and that's the stuff when you start talking about ultra high res images. That's the cool stuff because it's you're right. capturing all of that at the same time in one scene. Pretty and remarkable. Me, and like you say, the day to night stuff is cool. Yeah, but I think it's also a good segue to go over to the, the print side because we do have limited time and you know really can't see this as we've both been talking about unless you actually make the print. So let's talk a little bit about, you know, do you make your prints? What are you working on? How do you do this? Um, what are you using the drive printers and so forth? Yeah, so um, it's a, it's frankly it's a mix. So um, if I go back along, um, I, I lived in Shanghai for three years, three, well over three years, three and a half years. Um, I spent a lot of time out there working with a particular print studio to get it right. It took, as you can imagine, there's language barriers and all the other stuff that goes on. There's there's some unique stuff as well around things like humidity and heat levels. So you know, when Shanghai hits 45 degrees centigrade and 100% humidity, glue doesn't stick, for example, and stuff like that. Um, so, you know, we went through those sort of um, those spells with them. It, it was painful, but we got there. Um, then when I moved back to London, it was a case of, right, do I take this on myself? Um, having learned all of that, because actually, you know, learning print was almost as difficult as learning how to take the photo in the first place, if not more, actually, because you, you can you can screw more up. Mm -hmm. um, but when I came back, um, I, I made the call that we wouldn't or we wouldn't own print equipment, um, and it was for two reasons: one, um, for rolled print stuff, and some of the acrylic stuff that we do, we print on Fujiflex. 
Um, and I don't want to own the light jet printer and all of the, uh, the maintenance that's, and that's engineering that goes with that. That's 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 fun, I'm sure, for a while, and then it's going to get pretty pretty annoying. Um, and and frankly, there are people that can do it better. Um, and then for the framed stuff, um, I work with a you know, dedicated studio in in London that that in fact I'm up there with them on Friday. We need to do a little bit of um, signing and um, stuff with them. Um, and but again, it, it's funny. I must have spent between six to eight months getting them to get me, if you, if that makes sense. Well, so you know, in that case, you you're know, building that relationship with the, you know, understanding who your client is. Yeah. Yeah, but it was sort of you know think you know people think that color profiles are different, are, are difficult. Color profiles was always my, the least of my concerns. Um, it was things like, you know. When we're dealing with matting and stuff like that, we I I like a certain angle on the mat, and it's not forty five degrees, which is <laughs> which is apparently not not okay. Um, but you know things like that, you you get into this. How do you want your work presented? And and what I would say to people is, you need to think in those terms. It's it's not about how do I output this. So it, it, I, I hate that word when we use it output, right. because that suggests it's something that's you know done. Um, to me, I've, I've spent, you know, I don't, I'm not going to belittle it. We spend weeks planning shoots. We spend days actually getting the right shot. The actual shot itself probably takes, you know, 20 minutes, 30 minutes if we get it right and so on. But that print is going to be on someone's wall for 30 years. So if I look at where the importance lies, that's the bit that's lasting. The, the actual pic, the, the image itself, well, that's going to sit on a memory card or a hard drive forever and, and so on. That output, as, as the word uh, is, is used, that's actually why we're doing this. That's the result. Um, and that's that's what represents me. No one ever turns around and says, oh, yeah, this, this is Paul on this memory card. They, they point at a picture and go, Paul took that. Sure. So that, to me, is the most important part. And and it's, what, it, it's funny, to a lot of people, as a result, they will want to take it in house and certainly you know, we've got we've got printers that do sort of a1 and stuff like that we, we can do that yep. but actually what i found is my time and my expertise is better spent capturing i need to manage the process of producing the end result but actually there are people out there that have studied this stuff for 20 years plus who do it amazingly well and will do it for me in the way that i want them to um, and that, that's actually the biggest hurdle. It's getting the right people around you, the, the experts that can do what you want. That's, that's the thing. Um, I, a couple of workshop clients I've had over the years have, have talked about the problems they've had with print studios. And, and it's always been because they've had to adapt to what the print studio wants. And that I think is the the hurdle that I got over pretty quickly when I moved back to the UK, which was right. We can we can and actually I, I, I won't lie, I went through five or six different studios to try and find one that, that I say got me, the one that I could sit down and say it has to be like this. Well, so this is interesting though. You know, you you're you you take your pictures and you work your images, but and, and I'm sure you monitor the output, but you're not worried about that. Where I'm completely opposite. I mean. Uh, for 10 years of my life, I ran uh, one of the largest color labs in the U.S. And, uh, you know, halfway through that, we started moving into digital hybrid. And uh, I got to write some early digital imaging patents. And it was quite an adventure to get to know all the people. And actually, what I did there was what led me to my career at phase one. But, you know, I'm, I'm still about the print. I mean, that, you know, so I actually work with, you know, Epson and Canon printers and make my own prints because, now, I don't do face mounting prints. If I do that, I have a place to send those. And if I do metal prints, I have a place to send those. And as you said, you know, I build up, I call it my relationship. You know, they understand. Mm -hmm. uh, Raber's images come in. They know, they know what I'll throw back at them. Yes, yeah, so this, won't this is my recipe. It. I've got yeah, to follow. Yeah, they, yeah. they know. Yeah. And I know what to give them. Meaning, yeah. you know, I know because of how they're printing and what substrates they print on. Um, whether it's actually profiled or not, I know how to compensate the picture so that it fits their system. Um, and uh, the results are amazing. I mean, I love face mount and I love the, the metal prints, but you know, there's something about you know, regular prints and then matted and framed in the traditional way. And when I actually do it, I invite clients into the studio. So 
if a client says, all right, you know, I visited your, your place and I, I want this one as a 40 by 30 and I want, you know, two 1620s for my office. Um, you know, I have them come into the studio and we do a print party. And, mm -hmm. you know, as the artist, you know, they get to see the, the image come up on the screen. Um, they get to see me review it, double check it before, you know, we send it. They watch me put it into image print and, you know, select all the, the tools that, that are needed. And, you know, while the printer is printing the print, we sit down with a glass of wine and we talk about <laughs> photography. They get to know who I am as yeah. the artist. And I think yeah, I this agree. relationship with the clients, if, you know, yeah. commercial clients is one thing, but, you know, the, the commission people and people that are displaying your image in your house and going to show it to a lot of people is another. And yeah, they uh, know, when it you. comes off, they all get cotton gloves and we put it on the print inspection table and, you know, they get to look at it and, you know, see how nice it yeah, is. And I think, I think to, to the perspective that I have, which is probably a little different in, in that sense is if I look at our client base for, for prints, um, oh, 20% are in the UK. Yeah. Um, so, you know, so we, we've had... That's kind of hard to do. I'll tell you. <laughs> yeah, yeah it's, it's a struggle. But I'll tell you one horrific one. Well, we sent a... Um, oh, what was it? It was uh, seven... Like seven foot something wide um, face mount acrylic. And the way that we do the acrylics is slightly different. We don't use dye bond. Um, they go directly onto a, a thick metal um, that's diamond polished. And there's a whole... Again, it goes back to this is the process that I don't want it to be. We sent this thing to Japan. It must have cost about a thousand dollars in shipping, and it arrived damaged. And I'm like, oh, and and the stupid thing is, like, it's all insured. It's all it's all fine, but it's just that moment of oh, all yeah. of that effort, all of that time getting it there. And so, yeah, to me, a lot of our clients are, are um, face mount clients. A lot of them um, want it. The way, the only thing we won't print, for, to be fair, is on canvas. Um, and, and that's just because I don't like the way that my images come no, out. I, I, I did my fair share of canvas printing. That went away. <laughs> you know, there, sometimes <laughs> yeah. it's nice. If I'm um, doing a, a lecture, it's, you know, I'll, I'll print a bunch on canvas because it's an easy way to you know, transport images, throw them on the stage, and people can pick them up and wave them around, and you know they don't get destroyed. Um, so yeah, yeah, uh, they're less delicate. The irony is that they're, they're, they're more flimsy but less delicate. But I, I don't uh -huh. normally make those for clients. Um, no. So uh, curious now, if you don't do your printing and everything, how do you sell your prints? Do you have a gallery, or do they find them offline, or? So we um, it is it's a couple of things. So um, one is it, everything that we've always done from day one has always been online. Um, so from from the very beginning, I sort of made the call that said, oh, well, it's, I'm going I'm to conflict myself in a second when I explain the second part. But, <laughs> um, so I always said from the very beginning, I do not want to be one of the gallery guys. And, and you know, everyone can can name uh, the different forms of that that have come along. But, you know, the typical I'll go into a Vegas gallery or whatever. And based on the shoes that I'm wearing and the watch that I've got on my wrist, that's going to determine the price. You know, you say how much is that, and the answer is come into my dark room. I, I, I wanted nothing to do with that. So, the first thing is we put pricing um, directly online on the website, and and to a lot of people that was scary. You know, we're talking thousands of dollars of of print, and to sell to someone thousands of dollars worth of one image online, effectively no touch, is pretty difficult. You have to tell people why, um, you know, your why to buy into you? Because that's it. They're not they're not buying that picture. They're buying into me. They're buying into what I've seen at, at that point in time. So that that's tough in itself. Um, and then a few years back, we launched a gallery in the Maldives. Um, so it's uh, literally on a sandbank. Um, it's uh, if you look at it, it's, it's funny. A newspaper interviewed us when we opened it, and um, it, the answer was, sorry, the conclusion they got to was this guy's stupid. <laughs> um, because if you look at it, if you look at it in, in real terms, sure. they've got 44 um, overwater villas. Um, the average stay is about a week. So the most possible, and, every, and most people are in a couple. So the most possible customers I could ever have in a week is 88 people, um, which isn't a, necessarily a viable gallery. But we created enough enough of a stir with it, enough hype with it, and whatever, that it, that it drove a lot of um, interest in that sense. But again, it still drove it to online. Um, and, and we've been very conscious in terms of making sure that we it, we don't need necessarily a physical presence. And if I look at um, what's going on around the world at the moment, um, that's probably been a, a, a good call sort of medium term. 
some of the stuff that I produce is sold through galleries. Um, so we we have, you know, we, we've done um, some of the, the work with the Nat Geo guys, and um, there's some other stuff that we're doing with a company down in LA um, that produce, again, large format prints and whatever. If I'm honest, the, the biggest problem that I have with um, with working with an, a gallery that's not in my control, especially if they want to do print, is exactly that. They want to do print. Sure. And that takes it away from my standard. Um, so we only do it where we've got control or a say in, in what goes out because at the end of the day whether it's bought from a third party gallery from our gallery from an online web whatever it's my name on the back of that thing yeah um and that's that's the be all and end all isn't it? they're not going to go to the gallery they're going to be pissed off at me so well that's cool and you know it's it, i think the print part for me the print part's the most important part i still say you don't have a photograph until you have a print and you know we're in such a swipe society you know, it's what staggers me, and I, I have this. It, it, funnily enough, it's a, it's a workshop thing that it started with, but as a, as a result of doing some of these live um, sessions that we've been doing online, I found it, it, a phenomenal amount of people that have never seen a photograph they've taken printed, and and it it worries me because and and it's it seem it sounds stupid, but you you experience a photograph differently on the screen to when it's in your hand or when it's on a wall and and the whole thing is different and you you said you said you know you pick up on details that you wouldn't have done on the screen or you know you, you and, and actually you've got the ability to walk up and walk back and and whatever and and see it and fully see it not with all the clutter not with this blazing rgb light coming at you with leds blinding your eyes and stuff like that but natural light or or you know, gallery light, whatever, softly falling on all of that detail in a print is completely different to what you see on an iPad or a, yep. even a color match monitor. Um, and a scary number of people have never seen their own work in print. And, and you show, you know, oh, I, I had one customer, we produced a, a, a huge print for him, sent them to him um, so he could see. And he was, and it's like, this is your work. This is your photo and you're wowed by it. A, that's great. But B, please print stuff. I, that's this is that uh, it's still to this day just myths me where people will spend thousands and thousands of dollars on cameras, thousands and thousands of dollars on a workshop. And I see him or talk to him six months later. He goes, So how many prints did you make? You had like, if I remember correctly, two really good images. Oh, I haven't done anything with them, really, you know. So what do you mean? Well, you know, I, I put them on my TV set and share with my friends. So you got an $8,000 camera and you're sharing your images on your through Apple TV from your iPad to, with your friends. I said, that's great that you get to see them, but why wouldn't your friends want to see them on the wall of your house? Because if I ever put a photograph on the wall of my house, my wife would kill me. <laughs> she wants artwork. I said, well, what is that? <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, <laughs> and, you know, and and it's a crazy kind of the comedy and world in, in regards to that. Um, you know, and as photographers, but I think I, I think advocate. what's right. funny now is now, and it it's probably a you know recent sort of four or five years thing. I think it's coming back, and it's coming back strong because I think people are starting to turn off a little. And don't get me wrong, people are never going to turn off of it, but a little bit of a tapering on digital. Um, on this consumption, you know, 10 years ago, if everyone that had an iPad was on it 24 seven because, oh, it's an iPad, it's really cool. Now you're getting this movement of actually, do you know what, an hour before bed, I'm gonna put everything down. I might read a book or, you know, I'm, I'm gonna chill. And part of that, I think, is gonna help with this, of this whole, let's so. just stop consuming everything on a screen. Let's start, you know, appreciating things that are objects as well. Well, we're starting a series here at PXL uh, this week with uh, printing. And we're, we're going to be showing how during this lockdown you can be making prints at home using uh, the PictureMate uh, 400, which just does, does four by six prints, but you can do it from your iPhone. You know, and you know, there's a P700, which just came out, and uh, it's less than $1,000. You set it up in, instantly, hook it up to your Wi-Fi network, and now you can print using uh, Epson Print Layout. Uh, from your computer, from your iPhone, from your iPad. And, you know, there's no excuse. And I've been making prints left and right. Uh, I've, I've got uh, two I just did last night on uh, hot press natural paper. Now I'm trying out different paper surfaces. So th this was um, shot down in Florida. 
and it's matte paper, but the details in it, you can see the detail on the buildings on the dock there and stuff. And, uh, you know, he's, he's still got detail and it really came out to be a nice, you need light hitting this one because it's not one of the luster ones. And then, well, I was out the old yesterday with just the, with the iPhone. Nice. Uh, I shot a close up. There's camera plus app has a macro app. And I said, ah, oh, there's a wet leaf on the hood of my truck. I think I'll take a picture of that. And, you know, worked it just a little bit and not a bad print, but the point is now I'm holding on something, you know, and it makes a huge exactly. difference. This whole thing about, you know, a oh, phone camera versus, you know, take the ultimate, you know, I've got my, well, I've got this camera and I've got this camera. Yeah. The, the fact is, if all I'm going to consume out of both cameras is 1,080 pixels wide on Instagram all day, why bother? Because part of this, and actually you've just proven it with that one, the prints you can get out of an iPhone camera can be phenomenal. The prints that I can get out of a phase one are more phenomenal, don't get, me, don't get me wrong, but seeing stuff printed is a whole different experience. And actually what I've found every now and then is I've seen stuff in the print that I wouldn't have noticed on the screen or didn't notice on the screen. So it, you're de zooming or something. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, genuinely, I've, every now and then actually, we'll do a reference print simply to do a reference print because I actually use that then to do retouch. And it sounds weird that you're using effectively the, the, the hard copy to actually go back and, and do it. But there are some things that you don't notice until you see it, and oh, yeah. as in physically see it. You got to um, do it. And even things like, think about sky gradients and stuff like that. One of the biggest mistakes I see people printing um, is sky with, with, um, with a clearly defined gradient um, through it. Um, and it's because they've spent the whole time on their screen here. They've never actually stood back and gone, oh no, there's this line through my sky where, it, where I've, yeah, you know, I mean, I've done it the... eight bit or something stupid or whatever. And, uh, you know, that stuff is missed until you see it there. And then you're like, okay, that's a print. That, that I want on my wall. Well, you know, photography still is a, a complicated art. I mean, it, it, it involves the art you know, of our mind and our eye and the technology of the cameras and the computers and all the pieces and things they operate. It's actually pretty freaking cool. I mean, in the seventies and eighties, when I was doing all you know, photography and actually getting paid to do it because there was no other way, I couldn't be stealing it off of social media or anything like that. If somebody would have told me I would be doing photography the way we are today, I would have just said, ah, man, you are watching too much Star Trek. I actually don't even think there was Star <laughs> Trek back then, but really we are in a pretty damn golden age of photography. When you think about how far we've come in, you know, 20 years and what we're actually producing, what we're capable of doing. Um, it's still, I mean, I still have, Oh my gosh moments. And I thought I had those all already, you know, I do. With, with, and, and actually going back to your, your point earlier about sort of the working with the, the people like phase one and, and whatever, I, I had one guy, I remember say to me, um, you know, I, I don't shoot, I don't shoot any of that stuff. You know, phase one is, is beyond me, blah, blah, blah. So I don't care about their feature set. And I said to him, okay, do you remember the first ever like heated windscreen on a car? And he's like, yeah. Okay. Do you, do you think that started off on a Toyota Yaris? <laughs> he's like, well, no. Okay. Right. So, so where did it start? Well, it started off at the high end, right? Exactly. And actually for people that want to see what's coming, those are the guys to have a look at because yeah, you, you can bet that give it a few years, some of this technology will trickle down and then you'll end up with this stuff becoming normal. So the idea of, I'm, I'm pretty sure, give it five or six years, there will always be the use for filters for those that want to do it. Just like there is still the use of print um, through film photography for those that choose to do it. But for those that don't, you won't need filters going forward. And if you keep an eye on what's happening with the industry, as you say, it's, it's the most exciting stuff. And it's the most exciting time right now because all of those envelopes have been busted open. You know, we've, we've got computing power in a camera that is more powerful than anyone's computer was five years ago. What do we have in the iPhone? I mean, I can't believe yeah. it. the pictures I'm doing on the iPhone and I have all the apps on the iPhone to do it with. And, you know, I've got all this capability. It's, you know, like I said, it's a fun time to be a photographer and a fun time to, you know, take pictures. Uh, you know, my iPhone yeah, has got 94,000 images. Doing it again. <laughs> yeah, 94,000 images on my iPhone, for God's sake. Yeah. What am I ever going to do with that? I mean, if I... Do you know, someone said to me, um, it, was a, it was an interview I did a little while ago, and they said to me, you know, what, 
um, what camera what what's your go-to camera and I said that and and she sort of laughed and and you know well, obviously you mean your phase one I said no 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 I, I, so yes for for if I want the best of what I can possibly achieve then I get the phase one out but what do I take 99% of my photos on that thing and you know the, the, um, even when we're doing the big photos um the iPhone's a great tool for if I'm out shooting a landscape I a should reference. go shot with the iPhone it puts it on yep. the map you know now you if you you know, zoom into a map of that area, you can see exactly where and actually get to where those images were. I, I actually use it as well in, in some cases for things like white balance checking later on. So when, you know, especially on a long trip, so if you've been out for, you know, a week or two or whatever, collecting data on the card, it can be difficult to to, to get your mind back to, huh, what, what did that feel like when I shot that? Um, whereas instant reference, and, and of course, no, the, the quality's not up there in, in that sense. And, you know, it's not the thing that I'm going to print huge on a wall, but as a tool, you well, know, for... it tells me where the sun is rising. It tells me where the moon is going to set. It tells me exactly what time to the second. Um, it gives me my reference image for white balance. It, as you say, it tells me where I was on a map. This this is more useful than any other photography tool. There's, a, there's, a, there's an app called Viewfinder on there. I'm sure if you're using technical cameras, you've tried it, but you know, yeah. you can set it up for the film format size and uh, Put the lenses in that you want it'll show you the frame lines is for those and you know you can go like take a look at it and say oh god i'm going to need the 240 lens or yep. you know, this oh there's um oh what's it called uh there's what there's one that i use called photo transit um, yeah, photo so transit it's a, there's a few others well it's made by the people that do tpe the photographers yeah, yeah, photos, but it's, yeah. it's photo transit and honestly from a planning point of view i can put a pin wherever I'm planning on standing, I can tell it what lens I'm going to be using and it will show me my exactly. field of view before I've even got there. Yeah, I use now, photo pills If you said that to a photographer 10 years ago, that you'd be able to yeah. do that, like... I mean, that, it even takes into blowing. account the elevation of mountains around you and, yep. you, know, you know, so the true sunset Shadow might be eight o'clock, yeah. but you're going to lose your sun by six, you know, because of the, the height of the mountain. So, um, yeah, they're great planning apps and, um, I, I show them on the workshops and how, you know, we, when I go and pick a spot, why we need to be there. So sunset's not too late to 30, uh, but we gotta be there because it's going down beyond the mountain after that. And, you know, while it light up the clouds, nice, we might want to be there. So. And the, and the bar opens at eight. Oh yeah. <laughs> That's always important. <laughs> Look, I could go on and on, Paul, and, uh, yep, you know, we've, cool. we've probably yacked around almost for an hour and a half or more, but, um, Hopefully we can uh, do this sometime again. Uh, I wish that the world wasn't maybe out and about. <laughs> yeah. One one day our paths will cross, and um, you know we'll stand there and uh, drink some beer and take some pictures and have some fun. Um, I appreciate the time you've given today. Uh, I know the readers will like it, and I would like to get into more detail somewhere along the line and you know get into some of the. And maybe we'll do one just on Capture One and some of the tricks we both learned and, you know, share each other's screens and, you know, the battle yeah, of the Capture One Masters or something, <laughs> yeah, whatever. But uh, look, you know, it's, it's always great to talk to a fellow photographer. I think one thing I've discovered, and I'm sure you see it on your workshops, is that you can put 20 people from 20 different countries in a workshop together. And all the problems that every one of these countries have with each other is a moot point. You know, because the people that I normally see from all over the world. Especially when the sun comes up. Yeah, they're all just like us. They just want to be happy, take pictures, you know, enjoy the life, get the most out of life they can. Um, and, uh, you know, not to turn it into a political thing, but, you know, uh, it's crazy. I mean, I was with somebody in Barcelona a few years ago and they said, look, don't tell anybody you're American. How about you be Canadian today? <laughs> and it's like. Oh, really? Oh, you know, and, and I mean, the <laughs> fact that we're down to that in life and all the things that go along with it, it's it's really, um, you know, too bad. Uh, I just don't ever remember it being like that except for the last number of years. Um, so hopefully we'll get back to something more normal and, and concentrate. Yeah, on the fact it'll, that, uh, over time it'll get there. It, it'll get back there. But I think I think you're right. You, you need that. That activity is a good leveler. Yeah, uh, it, it takes all of that stuff away. We will meet again. And uh, from myself to you, from all my readers, thank you very much. And uh, no to worries. all my viewers and readers and any of those that watch this on the YouTube, don't forget to hit the subscribe button, ring the bell, and become part of the family. And, uh, hey, take care. And don't forget, 
at PhotoPXL, we're working really hard to enhance your image and hope this helps. Take care.